We're about to start. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I'm Lawrence Jones, founder, co-founder of the Center for Sustainable Development in Africa. Uh, again, thanks for being here. Uh, this afternoon, the last panel is going to focus on what we've called harnessing opportunities to increase access to energy and water through partnership and innovative investment models. The first two panels, we've really addressed some of the, the pressing issues around both energy and, and water access. And what we would like to do this afternoon is to have a, a very um, engaging dialogue on the whole subject of uh, investments. Uh, we know that the issue of capital access came up with regards to having women entrepreneurs invest in the continent. Uh, and looking at some of these issues in the context of what's being done and how we go about doing that, I think is something we want to spend some time on. So you have the uh, distinct pleasure to listen to a panel of, of uh, experts here today who I sure will, I'm sure will in enlighten you in so many different ways. To my left here, I have uh, Leslie Cordes from the uh, Global Alliance for Clean Coke Stoves. I know you heard cooking coming up quite a bit this, after, this morning, and so we'll hear from Leslie. <clears throat> to my immediate right is uh, Alexander Dixon from the Aspen Institute. Uh, and Alex, uh, in, in fact, the work they're doing is very interesting. And when we talked on the phone a couple of weeks ago, I, I told him uh, uh, I wasn't going to try and do any research until I heard it from him firsthand. So definitely looking forward to Alex's um, uh, intervention here. And then last, uh, far right, is Mr. Eric Gouchard from Hopestring, Homestring Limited. And uh, sort of a, Eric is going to help us at, at the end of all of this discussion to talk about how do we go from uh, practical discussions to technology deployment to, to go about getting the kind of investments we want. So because of some time constraints in terms of uh, how the panelists are going to uh, give their quick remarks and then get into a QA, and a we're going to start with Eric. And then after Eric, uh, we'll have Leslie and then Alex, and then we'll take a few questions and then go into uh, uh, Q&A with the audience. So the bios are in the, in the program. Please read it, because uh, we really want to use the time here to get into the discussion. So Eric, welcome. Uh, th thank you very much for, uh, for, for having me. Uh, when, when I uh, was driving and I saw all the, the snow coming, I, uh, I said to myself, you know, forget about the, the weather channel. All I need to do is, is call Lawrence and ask him if he's having an event. Um, actually, on, on a more serious note, I, after I, I, I do my five-minute talk, I'm going to have to scoot out because I had a pre-scheduled uh, call at, uh, at, at 1 o'clock. So I'll talk and I'll come back uh, for, for the Q&A uh, uh, session. Um, as I came in um, uh, early this morning, I, I sat in uh, towards the tail end of the previous discussion. I noticed that we're talking about uh, sustainability and, and how to tap into various pools of, of capital. And it, um, one of them was talking about, uh, one of the panelists was talking about tapping into the mining uh, companies who are there who want to do their corporate responsibility work, and others looking at uh, other NGOs and um, DFIs, development financial institutions, et cetera. Well, there is, in fact, uh, another source of capital which, uh, until recently, has been uh, woefully ignored, uh, and that is the, uh, the diaspora. Um, and I'm, I may be repeating some numbers that you already know. On the global basis, what we do know officially uh, from World Bank estimates is that you have about $500 billion a year that flows from the West to the emerging markets, person-to-person uh, -person transfers me to my relatives in Guinea and in Senegal using money transfer uh, agencies like uh, Western Union and, and MoneyGram. Uh, into Africa alone, the official number is about $60 billion. And about 25 percent of that number, uh, about $15 billion uh, per year, flows looking for investment opportunities. The, the key challenge uh, is, one, uh, these are uh, individual flows from person to another person. Uh, number two, uh, there's what, what we call the agency problem. If I want to invest in a project in, in Guinea, I ask my auntie to take a portion of the money that I send to her to 
uh, hire my cousin or another person to look for opportunities uh, uh, to invest on my behalf. That's very unstructured. And more likely than not, uh, six months later, I'll find out that the money was used for some emergency <laughs> that uh, I, I wasn't aware of when I wrote the check. Um, and so there is. Only seek opportunities, identify opportunities, and invest in those opportunities in order to capture uh, the wealth effect, but more importantly, to contribute to the um, economic, socioeconomic development of the country from which you know, they, uh, they hail. Um, and on the back of that recognition, uh, which uh, we came across, uh, in 2007, when uh, you know, we attended a diaspora conference at the World Bank uh, on how the World Bank um, could engage the diaspora more effectively, uh, we decided to try to figure out a way to, to solve this conundrum. You know, how do you uh, provide um, access to the diaspora in such a way that what you're offering is transparent, is accessible and it is compliant with the laws and, and the, the regulations. What we have found is that the biggest uh, stumbling block, uh, contrary to conventional wisdom, uh, are the regulatory constraints in the host country, in the US, in the UK. In order for a, an Ethiopian taxi driver who may have a PhD in mathematics to invest in a bridge in his country uh, that will you know, generate you know, gazillions of, mm. <laughs> that's my one o'clock call. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm they're a little bit ahead, I have five more minutes. Uh, so please ignore that. Um, in order for that Ethiopian person to invest, um, you know, they have to be a millionaire uh, under current U.S. Uh, uh, regulations. And so unless they do it illegally, uh, they basically don't have the ability as a regular uh, member of the diaspora to participate in the development of their country. Their country cannot tap into the 10 or $12 billion uh, in funding directly from the diaspora that, that uh, Ethiopia needs to build uh, that, uh, that dam. And so um, uh, we decided, home strings, uh, which is a combination of two words, homesick and heart strings, home strings, we decided to create a platform that basically addresses you know, these issues. One, we use um, our expertise in identifying and structuring and presenting investment opportunities that make sense to individuals. Uh, and then number two, those opportunities are offered in a very easy to understand, very familiar um, uh, uh, interface. The, you know, the investments look like mutual funds. Uh, the descriptions are very socially uh, friendly. Uh, there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer review of the various opportunities on the uh, site. And we have significant social tools that help people uh, feel comfortable about what they're investing in. The thresholds of investment are also uh, small, about $1,000. Uh, and no matter where you are in the world, you can have access to um, those opportunities. We are therefore aggregating these, these uh, investments into pools that are then in turn investing in uh, the underlying opportunities. And so specifically in the case of, of energy and women, you know, there are several studies that show that women are much smarter investors than men are, although when you look at Wall Street, you, you can understand why. <laughs> um, and, and so it, it is a unique opportunity for us to address women in the diaspora to better understand what kind of opportunities they are seeking, uh, uh, identify those opportunities, structure them in a way that they feel comfortable, and offer them in a very easily accessible platform like an online uh, portal uh, like, um, like Homestrings. Uh, we launched the company out of the UK uh, in 2011, primarily because the, the uh, rules in the US hadn't been, um, uh, hadn't been passed. They recently were passed in 2012, and I believe the final ones will be implemented by the SEC in uh, August, uh, or June or July of, uh, of 2014. 
so we'll be here. Um, and uh, since then, you know, we've grown our, our following. I think we have about uh, 10 to 15,000 followers, including members, including institutional investors who are part of the, um, uh, of the platform. Um, we've created a number of different uh, tools. We just launched a very successful diaspora um, uh, investment symposium uh, out of London. We did one on West Africa. We're doing one on Nigeria. Uh, next week, on the 7th of March, um, and then we'll be taking that uh, conference series on the road, uh, in fact, with, uh, uh, with uh, the, Aspen, uh, the Aspen Institute. So on that note, uh, I will stop and cater to my angry client, and I'll be back for the, uh, the Q&A. Thank you. All right, Leslie. Thanks, I don't have such a dashing exit, but um, <laughs> I thought what I'd first do is just tell you, Whoops, thank you. What I first do is just tell you a little bit about the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves and then um, talk a little bit about our strategy for driving investment in the sector. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're a public-private partnership that was launched in September of 2010 by Secretary Clinton at the Clinton Global Initiative. We have about 950 partners working around the world, all um, working toward one um, common goal, which is developing a thriving market for clean cooking solutions. So that's looking at the clean cook stoves themselves, um, the fuels, other equipment, and then the range of other kinds of training and um, uh, implementation activities that go toward the clean cooking issue. I'm sorry I missed this morning's um, presentation, so I don't know if you've already talked about it, so just humor me and allow me to um, quickly recap some of the facts, which are quite astounding. Three billion people cooking over um, open fires and traditional cook stoves using solid fuels that cause roughly four million deaths a year. Um, countless more millions of burns, illness from pneumonia, uh, COPD, heart disease, um, and, and other illnesses associated with the smoke from these stoves. So it's, it's a serious issue. It's astounding to me how few people know of this issue. And when we first started working um, at the UN Foundation to really kind of um, kick the tires, so to speak, on um, whether we should, in fact, engage in this. Um, many places we went, people were very familiar with the electricity issue. They knew about um, the lack of access to, to electricity, affordable um, energy was kind of in concept something they were aware of. But when, they, when you talk to them about um, use of, of clean cooking solutions, you got the blank stare. And when you told them that um, more people die from breathing the smoke from these stoves or diseases related to this than malaria, AIDS, and TB combined, you get the kind of jaw drop. So it's an issue that we think has been um, neglected for far too long. The Alliance has some key founding principles, and I'll just quickly run through them. One, we work at scale, so because of the enormity of the issue, we're focused on solutions and driving solutions that help us really address the scale of the problem. We're fuel and technology neutral, so we're not advocating a particular stove. We're not promoting or building or funding any one stove, but we're driving clean solutions, um, stoves, fuels, et cetera, um, that help reduce deaths and improve access to clean energy. Um, the consumer is at the heart of everything we do, so we're really focused on um, ensuring that our solutions and those of our partners really address the needs of, of the consumer. And for far too long in the cook stove sector, that has not been the case. Um, so we want to ensure that that um, it does not continue. Um, Monitoring and verification are at the heart of everything we do, so we want to make sure that as we do our work um, that we are, in fact, um, measuring results and measuring impact. And then finally, as I stated at the beginning, we're looking at developing um, uh, an approach that really focuses on market-based solutions. We're not about subsidized stoves, giving stoves away to people who won't use them, but really focusing on market-based solutions. Um, so the Alliance has a couple of value propositions, and because of time, I won't go into them in, in um, great detail, um, but we're looking at driving investment, at building the evidence base through knowledge management and research. 
um, at brokering partnerships, so introducing people across different communities and, and networks to each other to grow the sector. Um, advocacy and awareness, and we have a range of champions and advocates within the countries that we work with to do this. And then, of course, the market-based solutions and driving investment and impact. And if you, if you hear a number like 3 billion people without access to clean cooking solutions, you know that you're never going to get there through grants and public funding alone. You need to drive investment in the sector. And so from the very beginning, that's been one of our main um, goals, is to help um, develop and enable the community, the entrepreneurs, the enterprises, et cetera, to more successfully tap that investment. And I think we've done a number of things this past year that are very exciting toward that goal. Um, one, we've spent a great deal of time and money um, training and helping to strengthen our entrepreneurs and our enterprises to do the work they do, but to do it better and more efficiently. So that's everything from um, direct kind of support for developing business plans to um, ensuring that they have the, the staffing and the management, the financial wherewithal to run a successful clean cooking business. We're working with women's networks and a number of other um, community organizations, credit unions, et cetera, to, to bolster that um, base. We're working um, with a number of our partners who train entrepreneurs to help them understand the cook stove market. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit smaller. It's a little bit more entrepreneurial. Um, it's tended to be artisanal stoves, which aren't um, as good in terms of reducing uh, the health impacts. They may be good in terms of um, some of the environmental impacts. Um, but to get those super clean stoves, the advanced stoves that you need to really make a difference in health, um, that has not tended to be the purview of the artisanal stove manufacturer. We're also working on the other side of the coin with investors to help them understand the market, to help them um, realize that this isn't kind of the cook stove sector of your, um, where people go, ah, I did cook stoves in the 70s, it was a bust, they never worked, nobody ever used them, et cetera. We're, we're really in a very different place. We've got um, new technologies, new stoves, new fuels. We've got um, new kind of business models that we didn't have back then for, for helping enterprises um, credit, lending, um, we've got um, carbon um, finance as a new option. Um, we've got national programs that have really taken and embraced the clean cooking issue and helping to drive markets for clean cook stoves. Um, so we, we go to these investors and we help them understand the market has changed. We help them understand the promise and the opportunity involved in these clean cooking um, enterprises and entrepreneurs, and then we do some matchmaking. We have what we call pitch and deal rooms. Um, we do a lot of um, brokering of partnerships and relationships to help them understand. And we also work with investors to help them understand how to structure their loan or um, investment portfolios in a way that maximizes um, uh, impact for the sector. So this past year, and I'll just um, run through these very quickly and then, and then stop and, and, of course, take questions, we've introduced a number of new um, products, if you will, um, to help drive investment in this sector. One is called the Spark Fund, which provides grants of five, um, three to 500,000 for um, entrepreneurs and enterprises who are really at the kind of um, the precipice of scale. They're, they're there, their enterprise is strong, they have a solid business proposition, but they haven't been able to take that next step to drive um, private investment into their, into their project. And so we've been working, this is now our second round of grants. We just issued $3 million um, worth of grants in Kenya last, um, last week, two weeks ago, and the Spark Funds um, represented the bulk of those, those grants. Um, we do run that um, competitive solicitation every September and then release the grants in um, the early part of the following year. Um, many of our Spark grantees have gone on to attract quite a bit of private sector investment as a result of the strengthening work we do um, in either the, the Venture or Growth Fund. The second um, product we have is called the Pilot Innovation Fund. Those are smaller grants. Some are being tapped by women's networks and smaller um, women-owned enterprises, and we do have a criteria for that. Um, these grants are designed to help provide a small injection of capital, thirty to $70,000, 
to enterprises to help them really overcome a particular hurdle in the development of their clean cooking enterprise. Um, and so again, we just released a number of those grants um, in Kenya as well. And then we have something called the Women's Empowerment Fund. And this is a new product for us. It's quite exciting. It allows us to provide grants to um, women owned and other enterprises to help them drive clean cooking projects that benefit women. So it may be um, a small network in Nigeria that helps um, train women on um, the use of clean cooking. It may be a distribution model that helps encourage women to get involved in the distribution chain, sales, et cetera. It may be um, a women-owned manufacturing facility. But all of them have some component that really gets to the heart of what we're doing um, to strengthen and empower women. Finally, we have a couple of new products that are just getting off the ground. One is the working capital facility, and if you're in this investment space, you know that often you've got enterprises that are strong and they just don't have the capital they need to really continue their work. We had um, one of our partners came to us recently and they said, we have this huge order from the UN to manufacture stoves, institutional stoves. We don't have enough money to buy the equipment, the steel, the metal we need to manufacture the stoves to fulfill this order. Um, so that kind of working capital is really, has really been missing in our minds um, and is something that we feel um, really would go a long way to spurring investment in this sector. And so working with Deutsche Bank, we just launched the working capital facility in September and we, we're looking to capitalize it now. And then finally, on the carbon finance side, although carbon finance is really a little bit um, tough right now because of the price of carbon credits, we are working to set up a small fund with um, the gold standard folks and others so that um, some of those costs of developing a carbon finance project can be covered up front. Um, and then paid back through the credit so that people who want to tap that carbon credit market can do so without fear of going bankrupt while they're trying to do that. So that's just a number of the different things we're doing. I've, I realize I've kind of rattled through, through them very quickly, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, Alex, you want to tell us how we get the diaspora <laughs> pulled up to tap into some of these resources? Leslie talked about it, also Eric will talk when he gets back. No, definitely. Uh, I'll be brief because we're totally new. So uh, we are just uh, getting started. My name is Alex Dixon. I'm with the Rockefeller Aspen Diaspora Program. Uh, nickname of it is RAD. Uh, we believe that, uh, you know, we picked the nickname because we wanted something cool to say when we go out. We have a totally RAD project. My daughter liked that one. Um, but the whole focus of what Rockefeller and Aspen have come together to do is try to channel more investment from the diaspora back to their countries of origin. Eric's alluded to the number already. Everybody sees the big remittance number, $500 billion. It's three times the ODA. You know, why isn't more done? And Eric's also talked about how sticky that is. We've taken the approach of looking at remittances as an indicator of a store of wealth. And when you look at it as an indicator of a store of wealth, saying, okay, if I'm going to wire money to my friends back in Ghana or my friends in India, that's coming out of my checking account. Now, I have more than a checking account. I've got an account at Fidelity. I've got an account at Charles Schwab. I've got a 401k. And if I'm very, very wealthy, I've got a private banker who has money allocated to an international bond fund. I've got money in a real estate partnership. I have money tied up in a uh, private equity fund. I have a whole allocation of assets, which probably exceeds $3 million. And the only thing I'm doing is wiring money from my checking account. So when you kind of take a broader approach, you say, okay, how can I get this investment capital that this diaspora person has amassed back to projects that are either socially in impact or even for for-profit investment? Because Eric's alluded to that channel of how you create uh, an acceptable channel to meet all the regulations, which are substantial, is a hurdle. And many times what we're trying to do is have conversations with the diaspora investors to understand also what they're doing already. Every diaspora person that we've spoken to so far says, this is what I'm doing. I've already put my cousin through school. I've built my mom and house. You know, and one thing they've always told us is, just don't come to me and talk to me about a 1% investment. You know, I want to know how to make money back home. I know that a lot of people are, make, have, are making money back home. I want to hear about those opportunities too. And it kind of sunk into us and we said, well, if we look at a portfolio approach, you know, social impact funds and social funds are one part of one person's portfolio. They're not in, nobody has 100% of everything they have in social impact. 
and we kind of paralleled that and we looked at a couple of foundations and we look at the Ford Foundation, any big foundation, they've got their money in hedge funds, real estate, every for-profit investment that, that you can think of because they need to, those returns in order to generate the grant capital to make grants. So we say, the diaspora say, well, don't, you know, we want to be just like an endowment, you know. We want to basically invest our money for we can have the capital to invest in these social projects. So we're starting to tackle and look at that and look at the complexities uh, that kind of underlie that, one from a regulatory standpoint, but then be also from diaspora themselves. Each country has a different set of diaspora, different socioeconomic uh, complexities to it. One thing that we did uh, early on, we picked 15 countries and we selected five. The five countries we're looking at are the Philippines, Egypt, Colombia, India, and Kenya. That's a diverse group with very different dynamics. India, for example, we looked at uh, India and we looked at the millionaires that are in North America alone, just with the Indian diaspora. And one private wealth uh, report we looked at estimated there were 67,000 diaspora Indian millionaires with a net worth of at least $3 million. And if you multiply that, that's $200 billion, which is bigger than the top 50 foundations in the U.S. That one group has more assets than the top 50 foundations. So if you say, okay, even if 60% of that is tied up in their house, which it probably isn't, 35% of that, 68, $68 billion, that one group has to deploy into projects, into financial investments. And you start to see kind of the enormity of it. And when you start looking through the different communities, that's the idea of saying, look at these financial assets. So and there's different ways that we plan to look at this, and we plan to take a very practical standpoint in saying, okay, some of the uh, diaspora told us, well, you know, we put money in donor advised funds, but most of the donor advised funds only have U.S. NGOs that we can allocate our money to. And for those of you not familiar with a donor advised fund, it's a fund basically in the U.S. tax code allows you to basically contribute and get a 35 percent tax deduction. And when you put the money in, you legally lose title to the money, but you get to suggest who the money goes to. And what's amazing about it, when we looked at it, there's $30 billion in some of these donor advised funds at the Vanguard, Schwab, Fidelity, all the big houses have these donor advised funds. So you start seeing this huge store of capital that's there waiting to be deployed that can be leveraged. So we're looking at that. We're also looking at basically investment opportunities. How do you channel money back to clean cook stoves? And how do you channel money to NGOs and social projects? And the diaspora, what they've told us is sometimes they're just like any other American. They have no idea who to give money to. You know, they heard about this one NGO, they heard about another one, but outside of the top two or three that have the brand name recognition, they can't distinguish one from the other. There's no charity navigator for Kenya saying, okay, this NGO is really doing good work, they have certain efficiencies and so forth. So one thing we see is an information need amongst the diaspora for greater transparency of what the investment opportunities are on the philanthropic side as well as on the investment side. So we're trying to, over the next kind of uh, six months, we're going to go out and have a series of conversations with the diaspora communities throughout the U.S., start talking with them and really get a fundamental understanding. And one of the things we've been asked by our trustees board and the kind of global advisors is that nobody wants to see us do another report about diaspora. And nobody <laughs> wants, you know, and I think everybody here, you know, I always say, you know, it's on Google. You know, if you type anything in Google, you will get an answer. It may not always be the right answer. <laughs> exactly, that is very true. Uh, but the idea is that we really want to have a fundamental um, approach to this, and we want to figure out how we leverage what's being done out there already, because there's a lot of initiatives that are being done, there are a lot of different approaches that people are taking. We want to figure out how to leverage those most effectively, whether it's home streams, could be impact assets, could be another impact fund. How do we basically help the diaspora channel their investments back? into productive investments that they see as uh, far as developing their country and also that they see some economic reward from. So those are kind of uh, what the hopefully objectives that we, that we want to get to. The idea is over the next three to five years to channel, you know, at least a billion dollars back to these communities. And I think, you know, that we'll have a pretty good start from it because what I've seen so far is that every community that we looked at there's something going on already. You know, we looked at Kenya, there's an initiative called Startup Africa that's helping 
uh, with startup projects. India, there's different uh, initiatives, the Parathum Fund, or, um, different, there's the one uh, Thai, into, the Thai out of uh, California, they do huge events and so forth. So all these communities, the Philippine community is very progressive as far as how they engage their diaspora and then linking back. So there's a lot being done and what we want to do is kind of be the aggregation point and kind of the information point of how we basically can catalyze those investments back into uh, the countries of origin. Excellent. So let's, let's get into the Q&A here. So let's, let's, I want to start with you with one. You, you talked about some of the successes you've had. And clearly, the King Clean Cook Stove Initiative has really gone into support of you know Deutsche Bank and some of the big banks. How can the model you guys have used in Clean Cook Stoves be applied to other aspects of the energy water nexus, if you may? So, Clean Water Coalition, if you were to create something like that, what are some of the lessons you've learned that can be applied so that we don't have others trying to repeat what you've done, but learn from what you've done and sort of propagate it to other mm -hmm. other sectors? Mm -hmm. That's a tough question. Um, I think we've learned a number of lessons. <laughs> the first was you have to get, um, uh, you have to help people be aware of the issues. So I think with issues like clean water, climate, AIDS, um, you know, um, some of the other development challenges, there was much more awareness. So one of the things we did was underestimate um, people's awareness of the issue. And if they knew of the clean cooking issue, they knew kind of anecdotally, or they had seen an open fire being used once or something like that, but they didn't really understand the enormity of the issues. So that initial awareness of, of, um, of the issue, the impacts, and how um, partners can engage and, and participate was, was really important. Um, I think one of the things we were very lucky um, to have was a really diverse set of partners right from the beginning. So that's not to say it came easy, we worked hard at it, but we tried to go beyond kind of the usual development partners. Um, no offense, I'm one of them too, but it, 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 it wasn't enough to just have um, the same people in the room talking to each other. We needed to go, as you said, out to the investment sector. We needed to go um, out to the corporate sector, and we were fortunate in the beginning to have some very um, high-profile corporate donors who gave us the bandwidth and the, and the resources um, to do our job and to really kind of explore the issue and grow the alliance. Um, the third area, and this is, um, kind of a lesson we all know is things don't always move as fast as, as you want them to. Um, we were fortunate in that we had a good kickstart, a good jump start with Secretary Clinton that gave us the visibility. But we wanted to make sure that we, we set the alliance up in a way that was sustainable. So we spent um, at least a year really understanding our markets, doing an in-depth analysis of which countries we should focus in. You know, we have our own kind of list of five countries. We have um, six initial countries, and we've added two to that that we feel are the best suited for this initial engagement with a market-based approach. And um, we did a lot of groundwork um, with those governments, with private sector in those countries, with enterprises, et cetera. And we had some pushback from folks who said, What's taking you so long? Why aren't you, you know, getting off the ground and moving money and giving money away right away? And I think they didn't really appreciate the importance of getting those relationships, those um, structures in place so that um, we were sure that the money was going for the right thing and that the resources, the donor resources and investment resources people entrusted us with were really being used to full impact. So that's just kind of a, a few of the um, challenges we've had, and of course, there's there's many more, but can, some lessons learned. Can, before I go to before I go to Alex, one follow-up question. So, you, you mentioned you know special select countries that you're working on. So for the audience here, if someone wants to get involved in a clean cook stove initiative in that country or one of the other countries in Africa, for example, sure. uh, sort of break it down to the basics. What should they do? Sure. So. Just for everybody's background, the six initial countries were um, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, China, and Bangladesh, and we've since added Guatemala, and we're um, in the process of adding India to that list. That doesn't mean we don't fund in other countries, we do, but we're really trying to go deep in those um, six to eight countries to show 
um, kind of proof of concept on this market-based approach. So it's standards and testing, it's um, investment, it's um, communications and outreach and campaigns to educate people about um, the products that are out there and the impacts of the, of the traditional open fires. Um, it's, um, you know, everything from research to um, a kind of market-based approach. Um, if people are interested in engaging with us, um, we do most of our work through our partners. So um, we're a relatively small initiative with a large um, base of partners working to implement those activities. We frequently have requests for proposals and we take, um, we take applications for, for projects that people might have and I'm happy to talk. In addition, we're also really working to explore how we can piggyback or integrate this issue with other development priorities in water, in climate, um, in education. You know, girls aren't in school because they're out gathering wood. People are using um, uh, their crude cook stoves and precious wood or charcoal resources to boil water. If they had clean water, they wouldn't need to do that. Um, on the climate front, I think the connection is probably um, pretty clear. On the gender front, women aren't um, uh, finding the time to start their own business or to do other things they may want to do um, because they're spending so much time cooking and gathering wood or um, precious resources paying for expensive charcoal. So um, we're looking increasingly to connect and um, integrate our activities with other development priorities. We already work very closely with um, the folks under Sustainable Energy for All in the clean energy space, um, but I would love to hear from people who are interested in, in possible partnerships in other areas. Excellent. Uh, welcome back, Eric. Came back just in time. Uh, so, um, Alex, you talked about working with the diaspora, and you talked about working with different countries. Um, and obviously there are differences even in the U.S. in a different diaspora group. Can you talk a little bit about how, sort of a more concretely, how are you going to sort of a reach out uh, to the different mm -hmm. countries within the diaspora? Mm -hmm. and, and what are some of the challenges you foresee? Uh, and then lastly, just to give you three questions quickly, the last thing is how do you then get um, groups in the diaspora in the U.S. to engage in your activity? No, uh, definitely. I'm disappointed. I was about to offer to impersonate Eric while he was gone, <laughs> but he came back. So I think I do a pretty good impersonation, but we'll save that for later. Um, no, one of the, as far as engaging the communities, and one of the things I want to talk about is that uh, what Leslie was just talking about is kind of that whole information part. And one thing I see in the diaspora is that they're, I call them tipping point investors. You don't have to tell a diaspora person about, you know, cooking on open fire because they're familiar with the, the issue. So a lot of the ways that we plan to engage the diaspora is around the issues that they know, what they're interested in, health, education, are the two big areas that so far we've identified that most of the diaspora are interested in. So uh, we're gonna have a series of town halls uh, across the US. Most of the cities, you know, there's a lot of overlap. You're gonna hit Chicago, you're gonna hit LA, you're gonna hit Miami, uh, we're gonna hit New York. Everybody's in New York. <laughs> Um, I hope you're going to hit D.C. D.C., yeah, D.C. Right, right. as well, and also going out to the West Coast Silicon Valley. Strangely enough, there's a lot of Kenyans in Dallas. <laughs> Dallas and Minneapolis. So, so those cities are on, uh, on our map uh, as well. So it's been, you know, we're going to actually go out to the communities, and what we plan to do is we're going to work with the embassies in some regard and also work with the community organizations that already exist to bring the community in. And the idea is that we want to have kind of a dual track. We want to have a general conversation with the community. We also plan to have uh, kind of private dialogues with certain high net worth investors. And the reality is somebody who has a couple of million dollars, they want to go to a nice dinner, they want to go somewhere, and they want to have a kind of a private screening for themselves. So we plan to have a separate set of dialogues with identified individuals in the communities to understand what they're doing, kind of what their interests are, but the whole idea overall is to take the data that we collect and then translate that data into a product or service and make sure that we understand what the bottlenecks are as far as the community, what they're interested in, how they want to be engaged, and really kind of what they see as the important points and kind of, and one of the things you hit too is saying, you know, each community is different. 
and there are a lot of challenges as far as engaging the communities. Some communities, they like the government. Some communities, they don't like the government. So it depends on how much you can engage with that community. Egypt is going to be especially challenging for us because how that community is composed. You have a large Coptic Christian community in the D.C. Metropol metropolitan area. The California area is a whole different group. And what we're finding with the diaspora is that, you know, Sudan was one interesting example. The clan that's in Columbus from Sudan is totally different than the clan that's in Minneapolis. So if you go with an investment project that's in one area that the group's not interested in, they really don't have an interest. So what we're seeing is that the diaspora, even amongst themselves, there's a complexity. You know, we were looking at the Indian uh, diaspora. Most of the Indian hotel owners are from Gujarat. They're from one region. So that group basically dominates that one sector. So within those communities, we're going to take a deep dive and really understand what those complexities are from a geographical standpoint from, from their home country, and even from a professional standpoint to figure out whether a particular group has gravitated into one area, either from a college or university perspective. And that's another important thing that we're going to look at is that there's a lot of uh, your secondary school college ties amongst the diaspora, the old boys association, alumni association that tend to be the civic points and kind of turning points of the community. So we want to engage with those uh, communities as well. So we're going to try to take a diverse approach, but do so in a constructive way that leads us to some type of constructive outcome at the end. Excellent. Uh, before we open up to the audience, uh, and uh, please, if you on Twitter, uh, please tweet and <laughs> we'll get it. Er Eric, before you left, you, one of the words you mentioned was regulation and, and red tape. And so since you were gone, I'm going to give you two questions in one, and hopefully you, you can get through it. The first one is talk a little bit about the issue of risk and one of the concerns, anyone making investments in wherever in the world is sort of a risk mitigation. And if you tie risk mitigation to regulation, there are some linkages there. So I'll talk a little bit about how you guys uh, at Home Homestring are looking at sort of a calming down the concerns around the issue of risk. And then, and also the issue of education, uh, getting the diaspora to see home string, for example, as one of the platforms. How are you going to do this educational process after Alex has done the groundwork? How do you take what Alex has done and, and sort of expand it or scale it up to get to that 30 billion that we need per year to solve Africa's uh, uh, crisis? And definitely getting women involved in the process as well. So can you tackle those very easy questions? Sure. Yeah, sure. I think, you know, first, I think I, I want to commend uh, uh, the Rockefeller and Aspen Institutes for you know taking on this uh, this issue. I think the fact that that these two heavyweight, uh, extremely influential institutions got together and decided that the you know, diaspora investment was the next big thing. I think is is telling. Uh, as to how important this is from a policy standpoint for the U.S. I mean, if you think about it, the U.S. is a country of Im immigrants, and so we should be the biggest, you know, players within the diaspora uh, space. And I think to, to have that institution, you know, create this program uh, and to find a, a market player like uh, like Alex to to lead, I think, is is uh, is quite uh, is a, a quite uh, a positive uh, development. Um, in terms of uh, risks, uh, there are a couple of issues there. So the, the regulations, um, and hopefully the, the one from the SEC is here, so I wanna, <laughs> I'm going to you know, be uh, gentle. Um, the, the underlying assumption in the way uh, financial markets are regulated uh, in this country in particular uh, assumes that the individual who is, isn't wealthy, who does not have a million dollars in portfolio investment, does not have the sophistication to understand risk, whether the person is from that country or even is a sponsor or co-sponsor of a particular project. They, under the rules, are not able to invest in a private transaction. Um, now, you know, I've I know a lot of, you know, uh, calm down, Eric. I, I know a, a lot of uh, trust fund babies who are, you know, doing very, very well, but have a very, very uh, limited understanding of risk. But yet, under the rules, they can invest in, you know, anything. 
and you know, most of them have lost their shirt, but that's a different story. Um, so when you look at how the UK, for example, addresses this issue, they have several categories, right? They don't simply have one, they have several categories. One of them is, do you work in the financial industry? Do you have a CFA? Are you an analyst? Are you a board member of a financial company? Do you deal in risk assessment as part of your job? Oh, and by the way, are you wealthy? Yeah, so in, you, you have one of these five categories and you determine whether you're, you're, you're one or the other and you substantiate it and then you go on to look at you know, how you want to invest your assets. In the US, one category. Are you rich? Yes, yet you have access. No, sorry, you have to go look at the commingled mutual funds on the stock exchange. So that's one of our major issues. I think the, you know, President Obama's passing, uh, signing of the Jobs Act in 2012, which includes this element called crowdfunding, um, is extremely important because what that does, it, it, it sort of, it provides a democratic level playing field in terms of access for mom and pop to have, you know, have access to the same kinds of opportunities that, you know, Warren Buffett has access to, to a certain extent. Uh, and I think that that's extremely important. It's extremely important for the opportunities themselves in terms of fundraising, um, but also important simply in terms of, you know, in terms of uh, empowerment. Now, from our standpoint, so risk, uh, risk mitigation, the number of tools that we offer. So we, we, you know, we have a risk assessment on each opportunity. Uh, we get inputs from, uh, from peers to say, you know, I know this project, I know this country, I know, you know, these promoters, they have, you know, they give their input. And then also we, we give what's called a, uh, um, we offer a portfolio effect, which means that you may be able to invest in a very risky project, but you also have the ability to mitigate that risk with another less risky project. And so at the portfolio level, your overall exposure is actually mitigated, right? So you may invest in a startup, but then you'll invest in infrastructure bonds issued by the African Development Bank, which are rated AAA. So to the extent that you have a 50-50 exposure, you're pretty, much, you're pretty much hedged. On the other hand, we also have um, USAID has a very exciting uh, project um, under what they call the DCA, which, which is to provide guarantees on principal investment, which provide an incentive to diasporans to invest back home. And we are working uh, in Eastern Europe with, uh, with, uh, um, with USAID to sort of channel investment into SMEs um, in, those, uh, in those countries. And we hope to bring that to, um, to Africa as well. So one quick, my last question, and we'll start taking questions from the audience. I just want to come back to what you said regarding um, one key word, I think all of you alluded to is education, right? So from your perspective, if each of you just give me a quick 20 second remark on how do we educate the diaspora about one, the opportunities that you see out there, Eric, two, uh, Alex, from your point of view in terms of the, the various diaspora groups out there, what do you think we should do? And then same from you, Leslie, how do we educate people about the opportunities of investing in things like clean coke stoves? So if you guys can just give me quick, quick uh, responses on that, yeah, I mean, we'll go to the audience. We, we're a web-based um, uh, proposition, and so we use quite extensively all of the tools within social media and social networks, and we have found that that is a very powerful way to educate people. I think for us what's important is to provide transparency and access to information and empower people to make their own decisions. And I think there's no better way to achieve uh, you know, levels of understanding and education than by, you know, giving people the tools and letting them. So, we, you know, we have webinars, we have conferences, as I mentioned, we're working with, with, uh, with RAD, um, and, and I think that's, that's the way we, we are approaching that. Uh, as far as education, that we, what we're going to try and do is basically work within the professional sectors and clusters that we see in the community. Like, for example, one of the things we're starting to have a conversation on is that there's a large number of doctors and professional nurses. So the idea is starting to have a conversation with them around health, you know, and the idea is saying, all right, can we do a tech transfer fund that basically takes technologies from the US or from Europe and basically bring them back to their home countries? But I think that education uh, of the diaspora, from our standpoint, is it's easier in that they know what the problems are already. What we're trying to educate them on is are the avenues that they can use basically to help solve those problems and contribute to those problems. And then also teaching them what their collective might is mm -hmm. and how they can use that collective might to make a difference. And that they are the tipping point investors. That are the, they're the ones that are going to go in before Morgan Stanley or anybody else. And I think time after time you see that in market after market. It's the diaspora investors who are actually going in, making the investments, and then the big institutional guys come. So from our standpoint, we want to leverage kind of what they're doing and then aggregate and have kind of a lessons learned. 
well, this person who you didn't know about in Boston did X, Y, Z. He's part of the community. You're out in the California community. And give them a kind of a base, as Eric said, through the web and through social media of that kind of best practices of what other diaspora communities are doing, not only in their own community, but in other communities. And I think that's important as well. Okay. Leslie, quickly. Yes. So, Cool, your question, your answer to my question. Leslie has a quick emergency. She's going to have to step out. So let's take one or two questions for Leslie only, not for Eric and Alex, or Lawrence for that matter. <laughs> just for, just for, Le for Leslie. He makes it seem so dramatic. It's so, just a doctor's two quick questions. <laughs> two questions for Leslie. One up there. Oh. Okay, but so, okay, so but I only want Leslie questions right now. We can get back to, to the generic question if you may. Okay. Okay, go ahead, ask the question. Just quick, quick question. How do you decide whether to be a nonprofit or a for profit? Okay. And uh, another question for Leslie only? A Leslie only question there. Thank you, Lawrence. Here's my quick question, Leslie. You had mentioned in your um, presentation that there is um, some opportunity for manufacturing and women, with women on the ground. What sort of, um, I'm going to say, challenge that you have um, engaging a manufacturer that has a patenting product, product right? overseas to come in the context of an African country? Because that seemed like it's always a challenge to take the next step if an African entrepreneur would love to develop a manufacturing plant, you know, sometimes the hurdles about patent, et cetera, and countries that they don't trust, like Nigeria, comes on the table, which is a hindrance. So I'll answer that one quickly first. Um, the patent issue isn't as much of a challenge for us as it might be for other products because there aren't many cookstoves being made in the U.S., although there certainly are some companies and some entrepreneurs that we work um, closely with. Where we're finding um, more challenges is there's kind of a tension with some of the Chinese and Indian manufacturers who are making um, products under a kind of a more um, advanced manufacturing process and some of the entrepreneurs that we work with in Africa are a little bit worried about them coming in and taking their market and so we've um, done some work to broker some partnerships between Chinese manufacturers and um, African partners and in fact we just hosted a study tour to bring Chinese cook stove manufacturers to um, Uganda and Kenya to, to introduce them to counterparts and see if there might be some opportunities for, for um, shared um, uh, efforts. And we're finding that there is indeed, sometimes it's just in the construction of the combustion chamber for the stove, so the actual stove is made um, in Africa. Um, sometimes it's assembled in Africa. I just recently visited um, one of our partners' plants where 60% of the um, stove is made in Kenya. It's all assembled, but a few of the parts are brought in from China um, where the manufacturing can, can get a more standardized product in this case. Um, so we are sensitive to that. I think that the sensitivity isn't so much on the IP side, it's more on the artisanal versus, um, you know, kind of um, commercial manufacture of cook stoves. And there's some nervousness about taking jobs away from local communities. And so what we're trying to do is help people understand the job um, creation possibilities in terms of distributing stoves, um, training women how to use the stoves, partnerships with Chinese, Indian, or other manufacturers. Um, but, but you raise an important point and one we're really working to address. On the question of how do we decide if we're an NGO or a for-profit, we're in an initiative um, hosted at the UN Foundation, which is an NGO, so it's not even an issue, and we're not in it to make a profit. We're not promoting a particular stove. We're really serving as a platform for the clean cooking sector to advance a market-based solution. So that's more of a question for our partners. Do they decide to go for-profit or non-profit? Um, we have some nonprofit partners who have very profitable projects, and we have some for profit partners who have very um, low performing um, projects. So um, it's, it's not quite so black and white, but we ourselves are strictly a, a 501c3. 
We do. We do provide that advice. And if we don't um, have the answer, we bring in consultants who do. And one of the things we'll be launching in the coming year is a capacity building institute to help um, uh, enterprises and NGOs, et cetera, with a one-stop shop of services and business development and training and M&E, et cetera, because um, often by the time they get to us, they've made that decision, but there are some who um, perhaps should go a different direction, and we do try to guide them if we can. All right, thank you very much, Leslie. Thank I know you. you have to go, so an applaud for Leslie, so, so she wouldn't be here with encouraging applause. Okay, gentlemen, it's now up to the two of you to <laughs> deal with the remaining questions, which I guess are going to get pretty interesting. So let's open up. Uh, see, we'll, we'll take three rounds of questions. Uh, I see one there. Uh, well, let's, let's see if we can get a few others to ask questions first. One up front, and so let's start with uh, an area. Hi, um, thanks uh, for bringing up diaspora investing. I think it's a really fascinating area. Um, I haven't heard any discussion on gender lens investing, and as we heard this morning, women-owned small, small enterprises tend to have the most difficulty in raising investment. And in addition, rural enterprises in Africa um, they also have a lot of trouble accessing capital. Um, in my experience, for example, I met a woman in Uganda who owned a briquette making business who just needed like $1,000 to purchase uh, equipment to, um, to make it uh, a stronger business. Um, but I don't know where she would get that loan from because the MFIs in that area, frankly, were predatory in their lending. So um, I think that could be a great opportunity for an investor here who maybe has more of a philanthropic investment mindset for social enterprises to provide that kind of capital. So I was just interested in seeing if you're looking at this issue and if so, how you're addressing it. Thanks. One question up front. Hi, my name is Rose. I work for Senator Chris Coons and I'm originally from Nairobi. Um, my question is a follow-up almost to hers, but more specific to um, access to capital for the more uh, tech innovators and energy innovation falls under this and so they have um, Challenges accessing capital, but in a totally different kind of price range. So they're kind of in the 50,000 to half a million range um, a lot of the more formal capital markets uh, Serve really big deals. So what are the products or pathways to reach these um, innovators? Okay, go ahead gentlemen um, uh, on this issue of uh, uh, non-profit versus uh, for-profit, uh, from inception, you know, we were a, a for-profit proposition. Uh, you know, underneath that um, is what we think is a, you know, is a, um, a, uh, an, an, a kind of classic way of looking at uh, investments. We think that there is no contradiction uh, in uh, identifying opportunities that are both socioeconomically transformative and also profitable. Right? So uh, at the extreme, you know, a toll road that facilitates uh, access by the farmer to uh, urban centers to sell her products, that, as far as we're concerned, that toll road is a positive develop positive socioeconomic development that's also profitable. Similarly, you know, whether it's housing, whether it's power, whether it's energy, same thing, convergence between socioeconomic transformation and profitability. We, we, that's what we look for. Um, the, um, so for us, the, you know, the key incentive is that if our investors do well, economically in the investments that they make uh, with us, we also do well. So our, we are paid you know, uh, when they do well, basically. Uh, no. Uh, Al, sorry, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. I was going to just the, quickly. Um, so the, the other question about uh, women opportunities and uh, rural opportunities. Um, so for us, the, the scale is a little bit higher. Uh, because on the one hand, we're looking at aggregated, aggregating a, you know, a thousand, several thousands of dollars into a minimum of, say, uh, 100 uh, to $250,000. Uh, but there are other platforms that deal in micro lending. So, for example, Kiva, uh, Global uh, Giving, uh, MyC4 are ones that deal specifically uh, in, that, uh, in that space. 
Uh, and so I would suggest that, that uh, she look at those, um, uh, those platforms. Kiva is obviously one of the, one of the more successful, uh, successful ones. Um, and, and we do have women-owned businesses on our platform, incidentally, but at, at, a, at a much higher uh, scale. Uh, in, term, in terms of tech innovation that falls within the, uh, the SME VC space, so um, currently we don't do startups um, simply because we're trying to uh, protect the brand uh, for the time being. Uh, and then later on as we grow the, the, the platform, we'll introduce uh, VC and startups as an asset class so that people could take uh, very high principal risk in conjunction with other investments. But along the same lines, this relationship with the USAID where they're giving 50 percent guarantee does apply uh, to that VC space, and that's exactly what we're doing in Eastern Europe, where they're, protect, they're providing 50 percent insurance on every dollar uh, invested. And so we, as I mentioned before, intend to take that model into Nigeria first and other countries after. I'll do a quick uh, comment on the gender lend investing. That's kind of very important. One of the things we're looking at is Calvin has a women investing in women's fund, which was hugely successful. And the reason that it was successful was basically because it was gender, it was a gender lens fund. So from that side, we are going to take a look at that. And when we talk to the diaspora fair, I felt what they're interested in, because the whole idea is to aggregate the capital. And really, when we're out marketing, you have to market the people, what people want to invest in. So we are going to look at the gender lens investing area, and Eric already addressed kind of the dial level of investing. And then on the other side, regarding uh, startup and seed stage money for entrepreneurs, one of the things we're going to look at is that we've talked about financial capital, but the diaspora also have a lot of human capital. And my background is in private equity. And the rule of thumb was that to get 10 deals, I look at 100. And out of those 90 deals that I rejected, there were probably 20 deals that I could do, but they're just not ready. And I don't have time to get them ready. So one of the things we want to look at and talk with the diaspora is basically having some of the people in diaspora who have a certain skill set to help prepare those companies and work with those companies at a seed stage level and very concept level to get them to a point where they can take institutional capital. And I think that's a very important uh, distinction in the market that a lot of people don't get is that, you know, nobody walks out of a university lab here and gets money from a VC. You go to an angel network, you work with an angel investor, it's contacts and capital. You can have all the money in the world and be the brokest person in the world. And I tell anybody, if you go to the patent office, type in the patent thing, there is nothing you can think of that somebody hasn't thought about. <laughs> and the reason that there's not commercial, sometimes they didn't have the contacts or they didn't have the capital, but usually you need both. So that's one of the areas that we're going to look at as well. Okay, we're running out of time, so we're going to take just one, I think I saw one question there in that corner. There's none? All right, there wasn't any? Okay, uh, let's take the lady there, right there, so she hasn't asked a question yet. Be the last question, and then we'll wrap things up before we do the screening of the, the movie. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Um, I've really appreciated all of your, your sentiments here. Uh, my name is Robin Wong, and I'm working with Integra Government Services. Um, a question for you both. Uh, earlier today, we've learned, we've heard a lot about initiatives like Sustainable Energy for All and Power Africa, and I'd be really interested in hearing your take on how your initiatives will work or not work with these programs. In order for them to be successful, they clearly need a lot of private investment. I'd like to see how, I, that, how you see that working. I'll talk to the sustainable energy for Power Africa. I used to do a lot of work for Power Africa previously to come to Aspen, so I'm very familiar with it. The way I see us interfacing on the energy front is that for small to medium-sized projects, and that's defined as anything below 75 megawatts, there's no money. The reality is all the money goes to the 100 megawatts and above projects because of size and cost. So one of the things that we want to look at is basically when you get below 75 megawatts, if you assume $2 million a megawatt, that's still hundred and something million dollars. So those projects are pretty substantial. So one of the things we're trying to do is we think the diaspora who understand their country, who understand that they need maybe a potential investor base to invest in those particular opportunities, and maybe they'll go down to the 5 megawatt or 10 megawatt side. But I think those are investment opportunities the diaspora can look at. It'll give them maybe a 7 percent return. It'll give them something, you know, to invest back in their country. But I think it could be a potential investment class that's untapped by the institutional investors and won't be touched by the institutional investors uh, ever because of the cost overheads that are involved with most of the uh, institutional guys. Okay. Eric, any last comment on that? 
Um, you know, our, you know, we work with everybody, right? I mean, we, you know, we can't source all of the deals, and so we, our job uh, is to partner with uh, a number of platforms in order to bring what we think are the most exciting opportunities to the diaspora and to potentially aggregate uh, pool funds for those, uh, those opportunities. Okay, well, listen, uh, this has been a fantastic discussion. Uh, Eric and Alex are still around, still around to uh, answer more questions afterwards. So please join me in giving them a, an applaud for a very insightful. And so before we end, I'd like to call up Marilyn Smith, who's going to uh, give us a quick one or two minute intro of the premiere, the world premiere of the documentary Darkness, and that after that we'll watch it, she'll take a few questions, and then we'll wrap up the day. So please bear with us for another 15 minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've also, I'd like to introduce also Stephen Mays, who is the Director of Media and Distribution for the Energy Action Project. I hope most of you saw our little brochure on your chairs when you came in. Uh, I'm quick, quickly going to tell you that my background is science journalism, and then I spent three years as the chief editor. Sit down, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go, it's really good. Um, I spent three years as the chief editor at the International Energy Agency, and during that time I became very aware of the technology and policy dialogues that are going on in meetings like this. And I also became very aware that nobody's telling the public about all of these great initiatives that are going on. So my idea for the Energy Action Project was to create a multi multimedia platform that's journalistic based and allows a venue for energy sector players to tell the public what they're doing. Uh, and at the same time, part of what we've heard often today is that people just aren't aware of what it really looks like to not have access to energy. So we're going to take you first to Liberia and let you see what it looks like. Can we dim the lights a little for the showing? I think maybe the person who knows how to turn, oh, okay. Do we have sound? Is Ben around? We need someone to take care of the sound. Okay, we're going to start the video again once we have <laughs> the sound sorted out. So I. Great. Yeah, can we take the lights down as well? So as I said, the, the idea of this project is really to send a group of high quality journalists out. You can't the darkest world, you feel, you feel very, very you know, isolated. You can be harmed at any time because the evil men like to, to travel in dark. So when you are in dark, you think about evil. So somebody is looking for someone who can turn down the lights and then we will start again. Here we go. Okay, so can we put it back to the beginning? It's quite important to see and hear from the beginning. Thank you. You kind of uh, live in the darkest world. 
you feel you feel very very you no know, isolated. You can be harmed at any time because uh, evil men like to to travel in dark. So when you are in dark, you think about evil. Knowledge is very much important. The lack of knowledge caused our people to get into all of the mess librarians in Liberia found themselves into. There's a technical thing going on here, and the the um, video is actually quite far behind the sound, <laughs> so I'm. I'm not sure what's happened. The exercise is for you to be able to, to, to distinguish between or tell the difference between what, a circle and a square. The word correspondence says one what, to, what, to one. That is what we call corresponding. Okay? People wait for current to come on so that they can do a few activities, but not ready to study because the condition for studying is not you know, conducive. People like to study on a normal situation. Most of the may you find students waking up by the hour of 2 a.m., 3 a.m. to do studies. At that time, we are not, you no, know, yeah, we don't have current around us. There is no power supply because the supply is cut off by 11 p.m. So when you enter 11.05, you are in darkness until 5 a.m. We know exactly what the power source does, you know, the kind of contribution it made in, in society. But when the crisis came, all of those facilities were cut off. Immediately, we went into the darkest world. The first thing you lose is you cannot, you cannot uh, preserve your food. There is no electricity. So, and then the city water system goes. And then the sewage system goes. Hospitals cannot run because they cannot preserve those drugs that need to be preserved. Children cannot go to school because, I mean, the whole system just go on collapsing until everything disappears. For us, it was really a very massive destruction of the very fabric of the entire society. We don't have 24 hours, seven day a week electricity in Liberia, so we have to buy fuel oil to run our generator to provide electricity for our doctors to work. 
equipment that will require the electricity will not be in, in operation because we don't have money. In the night, when the electricity is going off, uh, the nurses have to work with the phone light or some other means of, of providing basic light for them to see. So that's the idea of the Energy Action Project, is to do a series of web documentaries as a gateway into a much broader web platform, multimedia-based platform that gives and anybody who's got an interest in energy, whether it's an energy consumer, whether it's a policymaker, whether it's somebody with a technology solution, we want to put all of that kind of content into one place and make it very easy for the general public to begin to understand the issues related to lack of access to energy and then very quickly switch to our focus to reporting on the solutions for energy access. And so we're really excited to be in a room like this where we hear what is going on in Africa and who is playing and what are the challenges and that there's, there's activities going on at a whole bunch of different levels. Uh, and so I, I think it's probably best if I just open the floor to questions after you've seen that. I would imagine you have an enormous number of choices of places you could have included in the film and people you could have included in the film. Um, how did you decide to cast it and how did you decide where to go? We're at the very, very beginning stages of this project. We're really what we're doing right now is we've gone off and done this one video. We decided to do Liberia partly because Lawrence is on our, our advisory committee and had told us what the situation was there. And to me, it was a, a particularly interesting story because it's a country where people had electricity and now they don't. So there's this, this sort of weird story that I, I felt was very important. I, I come from, my, my father came from a farm in rural Alberta and he could tell me about when he was 17 and he first got electricity. So he could tell me what it was like to live without electricity. In Liberia, people my age can tell their kids what it was like to have electricity. And, and so the, the generation that's living now has no concept of, of what the past was. Um, what we're doing in the next phase of the project is opening up a website where we will allow everybody that wants to to feed us story ideas. And then we will, as a set of journalists and with our advisory committee, will say, what are the stories that really capture um, the, the essence of this, this issue in Africa or in a particular country or in Asia. And which, one, which of these stories really merit 
the, the effort and expense that goes into this kind of documentary film. And then from all of the other stories that we have that might be related to that, we'll say, how can we treat those stories differently? Can we do them as feature articles? Can we do them as a radio documentary? Can we get people living in that country to help us get those stories together? So it'll be, our idea is to have a, a two-year time frame project where every three months we launch a new, uh, a new documentary. And so it'll be kind of like a, an online magazine that comes out quarterly. But in order to keep people engaged, we'll add new content that's relative to that story every week. So, you know, it won't be like you get your magazine today and three months later you get another magazine. You're going to get the opening page of your magazine, which is this compelling kind of documentary. And then every week we're going to say, here's something else that you might want to think about in the terms of this story. The other thing that was really important to me coming from the IEA and having not had a, a, an energy background before that was the learning curve that I had to go through in order to edit all of their, they do 40 or 50 publications a year and I was responsible for all of them. So I had to go through this hugely steep learning curve about the energy sector and I realized it's incredibly complex but it's also incredibly interesting. So an, a, Another layer of this project is to do, over the two-year period, an energy for dummies kind of component, where we're going to start with just describing to people what is energy, what are the different kinds of energy, how do you measure a unit of energy, why is one type of energy more, deliver more energy per, per unit of combustion or whatever. Um, and, and so over that two-year period, they will also get exposed to how, how does the energy market work? How do energy prices get determined? How does the carbon price affect the, the energy market? And so over two years, they would get a, a very you know, in-depth knowledge of, well, at, at a public, general public level, something very comfortable for them to deal with, but help them understand the energy sector. Then a third level of the project is really to create a platform where energy sector players can interact with each other and with the public. So one of the things that we're very, very interested in doing is, and we've uh, brought onto our advisory committee an anthropologist who's working in the energy sector and looking at how people relate to energy. Because it, this is fundamental, and, and this is something I also saw very often at the IEA, that you would get policy and technology people together and then have all these discussions and they would come up with solutions and then the solutions didn't actually work because people don't get it or they don't want to use their energy that way. Uh, and so one of the things we're going to do in a couple of weeks is, um, is and it's very important for us too to say that, that yes, this is a huge problem in Africa in terms of no access to energy, but in emerging economies and industrialized economies, energy is also an issue, access to energy. And in a couple of weeks, we're gonna to go to Northern Ireland and look at the issue of fuel poverty where people simply can't afford to pay their energy bills anymore. And the story that we're going to look at there is um, the relationship between excess winter deaths and cold homes, which has been studied in terms of heart disease and respiratory disease for a number of years. But recently a, a woman from the University of Ulster has looked at it in terms of people who have early Alzheimer's and early dementia. Uh, and the rates of excess winter deaths for, for that disease category is much, much higher than for cardiac or, or respiratory. And part of that is this, is this is, in the early stage of diagnosis, people think you're okay to live at home and to manage your heating system, and, they, and then they find out you're not. Um, and if you were at a more advanced stage of the disease, you would probably living with, be living with family or be living at, you know, in, a, in a home. But one of the things that we find particularly interesting about this story is there's been a lot of talk today about how women in, uh, are, are the energy managers of their households and how much time they spend doing it. One of the things we're going to look at in Northern Ireland is it is traditionally the man's role to take care of the household energy. And so if you're a, a woman whose husband is in the early stages of dementia, you have to suddenly look after your husband and you have to learn how to run the boiler and you're probably got, um, you're probably running on oil. So there's no utility company that's gonna know if your oil tank is empty. You have to learn how to manage all of those things at, at an advanced stage when you're, you know, what you're really worried about is your husband. So it's, it really is a project that is gonna try to, 
one of the main reasons we wanted to do the fuel poverty aspect is to say, you know what, energy matters everywhere. Um, and if, if we as North Americans and Europeans can understand that maybe our neighbor has energy access problems, that's a really important entry point into understanding the energy problems that are still going on in emerging and, and developing economies as well. I would just say that the, the, the question of where we get our stories from is actually really a lot of the reason why we're here, is we're going to get our stories from you. And so if you are aware of issues that need to be made vivid and powerful and emotional in the way we've just seen here, please let us know. If you have contacts or clients who see value in, in developing that kind of resource, we want to meet them because we really see ourselves as a tool to be putting this word out. So the more, the more we can draw on your expertise and your resources, the more powerful we all will be. So where we get our stories from is uh, the expertise we have in this room. There you go. Uh, first of all, let me take this opportunity to thank each of you who've stayed here the entire day, and thanks for coming. Uh, those of you who followed us on the web, thanks also for being on the web. Uh, I want to especially thank uh, Jennifer Cook and Frank Verastra at uh, CSIS for, uh, and their staff, including Ben and, and Molly, for all their assistance in, in making this happen. I want to thank uh, uh, Rashinda Van Leeuwen and her staff, and Eri and others at the UN Foundation, Madavi as well, for your support. This has been a three times or three strikes you're out event, as you well know, and uh, we made it in the third strike, so that's great. Let's thank also Brookings Institution, uh, Charles Ebinger, as well as Tim Borsner for their support. And I also want to thank the, the volunteers and, and, and members of the Center for Sustainable Development in Africa. Uh, I think uh, some of you are here still. Uh, thank you for your support in making this happen. And I think, to sum it up, I think we have uh, hopefully raised the awareness of the importance of women in, in energy and water and the opportunities. Uh, for me, this was, uh, like Frank said, this has been a burning uh, topic for me for several years, and I was pleased, I was telling Rashinda, I have never been to an event on energy and water where I saw so many women. So if you were to ask me, was this a successful day in terms of the participation of women? Yes. In terms of the substance? Yes. And in terms of the weather? Yes. So uh, on that note, thank you very much, and we'll keep you posted as things evolve, and have a wonderful sunny day. Thank you.